Tyrant Files is going to be the best possible product I can make, and will go more in depth than it needs to. So that's why it took so long to make this, and will take even longer to finish. Since science is science, stuff is always changing, and new things are discovered on a weekly basis. So it's very probable all I discuss will have to be adjusted over time. I'll make sure to let you know when that happens. Enjoy the new content, I think it will be something you can really sink your teeth into. With that out of the way, go check out some Edge merch at the Teespring and Redbubble sites so we can get Christopher Lloyd or Morgan Freeman to narrate an episode or two. We have traversed time and space to get an understanding of the evolution of the tyrant dinosaurs. Last time we found out how far back we needed to go, and made it there. Solorosuria is an enormous clade filled to the brim with amazing animals of all shapes and sizes. We saw the diminutive stature of the Compsognathids, the lack of confidence science has in saying exactly what the first Tyrannosaur ancestor was, and we saw just how well preserved some of these little ankle biters could get. Now we sally forth to mark new territories we have yet to chart into the belly of the beast to get to the public's most beloved Tyrannosaurus Rex. Welcome back to Tyrant Files. I left step one to making a T-Rex for the first part, because it required a lot more exposition than the rest of our journey. Now that I've briefly discussed what phylogenetics is, and how it is used to connect one group of fossil animals with another, I can take that knowledge and connect more dots. So let's get back to it, shall we? Let's make a T-Rex! Step two. Fans, crests, wattles, it's sizzling! We will now jump ahead in our evolutionary time machine to explore a clade that would seem to give away our final destination, Tyrannoraptora. Tyrannoraptora is the enormous clade we will now be entering evolutionarily. All the loose ends are not tied up, so don't look too closely or you'll notice just how much of a mess it currently is. It's filled with taxon awaiting more specific placement in their respective groups. Compsognathidae is probably outside this group, but it cannot be said for certain, as some researchers have put the group of little critters inside and outside the clade at various times, for various reasons. Tyrannoraptora is an enormous group. The group began diverging during the Jurassic, and it's very likely all of the progenitors of these various groups looked alike. After all, they were all still doing the same things. One lineage diverged into the Compsognathidae, which were all small, quick animals covered in downy primitive feathers and used long skinny tails to keep balance. Another divergence of the Tyrannoraptora were the Manoraptoromorpha clade. The Manoraptoromorpha may be more important than the Tyrannosaur lineage, to us anyways, since certain animals adapted to be some of the most lightweight vertebrates on the planet light enough to take to the air on aerodynamic feathered wings. And you probably eat them for dinner every other day. Alongside the birds, the Manoraptoromorpha includes the parrot-beaked Oviraptorosaurs, the sickle-clawed Dromaeosaurs, sloth-like Therizinosaurs, ostrich-mimicking Ornithomimosaurs, bizarre one-clawed Alvarosaurs, and the bat-winged Scansoriopterids. One lineage branched to take advantage 
of the power vacuum created as a result of the megafaunal changes during the early Cretaceous. This group was the Tyrannosauroidea superfamily. During the Jurassic and in certain places during the Cretaceous, a certain group of predators were at the top of the food chains. These were the Allosaurs and the Megalosaurs. The European Neo-Venator used its massive forearms to tackle the equally well-armed Iguanodon. The enormous Torvasaurs hunted down Kentrosaurus and Dicryosaurs. While the Morsen Formation, North American Allosaurs and Ceratosaurs tried their claws at making meals out of Stegosaurus, Brontosaurus, and Camptosaurus. You know these creatures well, for they are the poster children of the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous the top predators for a rather long time. Early Tyrannosaurs started to move into these places while these top predators were still large and in charge. Sneaking into the niches of the smaller predator, these new animals were more adept at pursuing their prey and inflicting hard strikes. They developed a mechanism in their ankles that binded the bone together as one. Their feathered pelts kept them warmer and their fancy head crests made them irresistible to the opposite sex. These early forms of Tyrannosauroidea were the Proceratosaurids. Proceratosauridae is named after the first member of the group found, Proceratosaurus bradleyi. The wonderfully preserved, nearly three-dimensional skull of Proceratosaurus was discovered in the early 1900s in England while workers were attempting to excavate for a reservoir. I said the skull is well preserved, and it is, but it is entirely missing the top half. Almost like the whole fossil asked for a buzz cut and the barber decided to go for the brain. The name Proceratosaurus should tip you off that, like Solorus and Ornitholestes, it too had a tumultuous history of where it stood on its tree of life. Proceratosaurus was originally thought to be related to Ceratosaurus due to the little nub of a horn atop its snout. Arthur Woodward was the paleontologist to assign this classification, considering the animal to be a possible ancestor to the three-horned beasts of the late Jurassic. After Ceratosaurus was found to be far more primitive than previously thought, Proceratosaurus was aligned with the Solorosaurians, and eventually as a relative of Ornitholestes. It took the discoveries of animals far more similar in appearance to Proceratosaurus than any other animals to show Proceratosaurus to be related to the Tyrannosaurus. Thus, the new group Proceratosauridae was erected to house all of these bizarre early examples of Tyrannosaur evolution. Along with Proceratosaurus is the late Jurassic Chinese Guanlong. Guanlong was rather small, like Proceratosaurus and had an ostentatious fan of bone on the top of its head, likely used as a bulletin board to other Proceratosaurs. A Middle Jurassic representative from Russia was Kaleskis, which is rather fragmentary, known only from pieces of the front of the skull and pieces from the hands and feet. Proceratosaurids varied in size, generally being no larger than 6 meters, but some may have been just a tad more massive. In 2009, a much larger Proceratosaurid was added to the roster. The early Cretaceous Sinotyrannus is known from the front of the skull, a finger, and pieces of the hip and sacral vertebrae. When it was first described, Sinotyrannus was thought to belong to the more advanced group Tyrannosauridae, but later this was found to be incorrect, as the anatomy suggests it is related to the fan-crested, long-armed Proceratosaurids. A study done in 2016 by Stephen Brasati and Thomas Carr placed Euteranus into the Proceratosauridae group as a sister taxon to Sinotyrannus after Kileskis. This study also took Jurotyrant, Stochisosaurus, and Dilong out of the group and booted them up to a more derived place amongst the later Tyrannosauroids. Until another study comes along, potentially due to new discoveries. This assessment is considered more aligned to the fossil data than previous tests. Euteranus and Sinotyrannus present unique variants of the Tyrannosaur lineage, 
both Eutyrannus and Sinotyrannus derive from early Cretaceous China, and both reached similarly large sizes. This shows tyrannosaurs of some affinities were able to reach these sizes, despite being in the presence of allosaurs and megalosaurs. Eutyrannus, in particular, is known from three nearly complete specimens, which show different life stages, and all of them preserving impressions of feathers, coating most of their bodies. These specimens are therefore the largest known fossils of a prehistoric animal to preserve feather impressions and would suggest dinosaurs were able to reach larger sizes and retain their feathery coatings. Using the reasoning of phylogenetics, finding feathers amongst large members of more basal offshoots of the Tyrannosaur group, as well as finding them prevalent in the smaller, even more ancient forms, like Sinoceropteryx, Shipionyx, Dilong, and so on, tells the scientists presence of feathers is a characteristic which appeared early on in the evolution of the tyrant dinosaurs. This line of evidence would suggest most, if not all, following members of the group have the evolutionary capacity and ancestral genes to use feathers as a covering for their bodies. Now don't get me wrong, it is more than likely the later variants and groups of tyrannosaurs lost their feathers due to varying changes in their environment or body plan, and it's also likely groups of tyrants lost their feathers and gained them again separately over millions of years. Presence of feathers early on means they were a primitive trait going further back than the Proceratosaurids. The Proceratosaurids were an offshoot and not a more direct lineage into the later thick-set tyrants, which is obvious in their long, three-clawed forearms, thin crests along the midline of their skulls, lack of gnarled outgrowths on their faces, blade-like teeth and thin snouts with less room for extremely powerful jaw muscles something the rest of the group found to be a path of least resistance and a good way to get your yummies. Let's make a T-Rex! Step 3, Tyrannosauroidea Central, here we come! Tyrannosauroidea is split up into Proceratosauridae and Pantyrannosauria. The Eurasian Proceratosaurids have already outstayed their welcome, and it is now into Pantyrannosauria we go. Pantyrannosauria currently holds clusters of related animals and the clade Eutyrannosauria. More closely related to the basal members of the Tyrannosauroidea clade are animals like Avaya tyrannus of late Jurassic Portugal and Bagaratan of late Cretaceous Mongolia. These Tyrannosauroids are both known from very vague fragments, so their true form in life is impossible to know. But what we do know of them suggests small predators of 1 to 3 meters. It is possible they may have had three-fingered arms for grasping as well. Dilong is a tyrannosauroid and shows a reduction in the forearms, but still has three fingers that it might have used to snag unsuspecting mammals. The fossils of Dilong preserved a feathery coating and the shape of its brain. Scans of the brain case showed Dilong's brain was S-shaped and was not as well developed in the scent department as the later tyrannosaurs were. Tyrannosaurs were world travelers, as you'd probably surmise from our run-ins with earlier family members. Tomimus was described in 1993 from fragmentary remains uncovered at the East Dinosaur Cove site in the southernmost tip of Australia. Originally thought to belong to an ornithomimosaur, hence the name, Tomimus is now thought to be a tyrannosauroid related to another small tyrannosauroid from South America. In order to find this small tyrannosauroid, we must travel 20 million years into the future, to the early Cretaceous of Brazil. We'll find our next animal to be Santanaraptor. Santanaraptor is named for the geologic formation it was found in, the Santana Formation. Like its relatives and forebears, Santanaraptor used three fingers and long arms to catch its food, and it was a thin little thing that reached around 1 to 1.5 meters long. About 145 million years ago, during the early Cretaceous of England, a lush world of hooting Iguanodon, scampering Hepsilophodon, and waddling Polacanthus invades our senses. Here is the transition between the worlds of the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, as ornithopods become more present, and sauropods see their vibrant diversity decrease. Prowling the dense woodlands was Eotyrannus langi, 
Four meters long, this predator had three raptorial talons at the end of its paws, which were attached to long, well-defined arms. This zesty European tyrannosauroid has long been considered a part of the tyrant dinosaur group, with some of the more recent scientific research placing the beastie amongst the misfit groups of critters like Jura Tyrant, Bagaratan, and Stokisosaurus in a more closely related grouping. A 2014 analysis of the animal by Porphyry and others suggests it may belong to a group of mysterious carnivores called Megaraptorins, known for their large hand claws and pointy faces. Since science is science, another analysis reported in 2016 by Stephen Brissati and Thomas Carr still place the animal amongst the Tyrannosauroids. So I'm just gonna leave this confusing mess alone and delve more deeply into what it is in its own video. Moros Intrepidus is a newly described little tyrant from the beginning of the late Cretaceous United States. Known only from very fragmentary remains, the leg fossils show it was a fast runner and a gawky beast with disproportionate limbs. Dating the remains of Moros have found it to be the earliest diagnosable tyrannosauroid from North America at around 96 million years ago. Unfortunately, it is unknown just how primitive or advanced the rest of its anatomy was, so we must now move on ahead in time and south in space. After Moros comes Susky Tyrannus known as the Zuni Silurosaur for nearly 20 years, even having a cameo in When Dinosaurs Roamed America. It finally received a formal description and naming in 2019, and represents one of three related forms of Tyrannosauroid newly found. Susky Tyrannus was probably a hunter of the contemporary Zuni Ceratops, as Ceratopsians were starting to become more widespread and brandished little horns and shields, like knights, ready to defend their castle against any marauding dragons. Alongside Susky Tyrannus and Moros is Timurlengia. Named after the Mongolian conqueror Timurlang, Timurlengia was described in 2016 and represents a continued transition between the small-bodied, thin-proportioned early tyrannosauroids and the thick-set beasts of the late Cretaceous. Known only from a paltry cornucopia of fragmentary bite-sized snacks, Timurlangia shows anatomical features suggesting tyrannosaurs adapted first their giant meat-cleaving bone-pulverizing heads, quickly followed by the short arms and heavy torsos. This is clear with Timurlangia because the brain case was preserved, which shows development of the brain in areas needed to operate a much larger head with powerful jaw muscles and an enhanced sense of sight, smell, and hearing. While we're still in Asia, we should head on over to China to check out another step in Tyrannosauroid evolution. Xiong Guanlong was described in 2010 based off a skull, vertebrae, parts of the pelvis, and a femur. This Tyrannosauroid was a bit different from Timurlangia and other earlier Tyrannosauroids in being 4 meters long and sporting a pointed snout. Its arms show continued transition between a long-armed, weak-jawed animal to a meat-mushing powerhouse with enormous jaws, small arms, and wide chest, just like what we were seeing in Timurlangia. Electrosaurus was uncovered from Mongolia in the 1930s by scientists from the American Museum of Natural History. This mysterious beast is known only from very fragmentary fossils, mostly just foot bones which suggests a tyrannosauroid related to the early Mongolian tyrants. We have currently discussed a section of the Tyrannosauroidea, which has been designated the Pan-Tyrannosauria group by some researchers, and next up is the Eutyrannosauria group. Just as Pan-Tyrannosauria had a lot of floating singular taxa with obvious relationships with other floating taxa, Eutyrannosauria follows suit with the exception of holding the Tyrannosauridae. Appalachia is a beautiful place. Before the mountain range existed, before the hillbillies and moonshine, and before European colonization, a short-lived lineage of tyrants ruled these lands. Dryptosaurus is the first of the two animals so far described, which represented the first wave of tyrannosaurs to move into North America. Dryptosaurus was also 
the first officially described and named theropod dinosaur from North America. At the time of its discovery, only very small pieces from the skull and limbs were known of Megalosaurus, so everything about Dryptosaurus was modeled off the Mega Reptile. Over time, it has become clear upon further analysis that Dryptosaurus was a Tyrannosauroid. Dryptosaurus was not a trendsetter and simply followed the formula. Big head, short arms, strong bite. Dryptosaurus was rather large, at seven and a half meters or so, and had smaller arms than its predecessors. Another Tyrannosauroid would be discovered much later, around the same region of the United States, by geologist David King in 2005, and it brought with it some new techniques to tackle its prey. Appalachiosaurus is far more complete than the last couple of Tyrannosauroids, with a rectangular skull adapted for crushing through bone, and a shorter and thicker neck than Dryptosaurus, Zion Guanlong, and Timurlangia. Right before Tyrannosauridae is placed Bistahi Eversor. The new Mexican tyrant was described in 2010 from a few specimens comprising a good number of identifiable fossils. For the longest time, this Tyrannosaur had remained under the outdated name Obelisodon, which had originally been given to a bunch of teeth discovered in the 1800s. Bistahi Eversor was different from the other Tyrannosaurs by having a bony keel on its lower jaw, an extra opening above the eye socket that may have helped keep the skull light, and 64 teeth studding its teardrop-shaped skull. We have come a long way. We've seen the rise and fall of the Proceratosaurids as they attempted to be both Allosaurs and Tyrannosaurs simultaneously. We saw the fall of the true Allosaurs, and as we'll soon find out, what their die-offs in the Northern Hemisphere meant for the development of the Tyrannosaurids. Next time on Tyrant Files, we'll reach the end of our travels, and we'll see the changing Earth come to reflect a continental geography much more akin to our modern world. And we'll see the Western Interior Seaway expand into North America and separate new lineages of tyrants before the final lineage comes in and destroys the native tyrants. Next time on Tyrant Files, Royal Bloodlines. Thank you for watching. If you like our content and want to support us, like this video, subscribe, leave a comment on what I can do better, ring the notification bell, and maybe pop on over to our merch stores to get some of our new merch. Woo! <laughs>